What's going on, Champagne Gang, Fizz Fam, Confidant? <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Sip, Savor, and Spear. If this is your first time here, hi, I'm the Empress, and you are joining me in the chalet located in Champagne City, baby. You see it, you see it. And you're joining me for grown discussions and bubbly banter. Over here, we give classy with a twist, huh? A little clink with chaos with a side of charm. So if you're ready to sip, savor, and spill, then come on in. On your way in, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. Hit that notification bell so you'll be notified when we jump into whichever sector we jump into for another show. Now for today, instead of our positive and affirmations, I feel like we need a little prayer. Mm -hmm. My uncle just recently went into the hospital with an aneurysm over his heart and he had to be rushed to another state in order to have surgery. So today I feel like it's only befitting that we say a prayer for all of my confidants that may be struggling with financial issues, health issues, mental health issues. Is that okay with y'all? That's okay with y'all. Go ahead, bow your head, and let's get ready to pray. God, we thank you. Thank you for another day that you've allowed us to see. God, we thank you. We thank you that while others didn't get an opportunity to see today, you allowed us to see it. God, we thank you. And God, right now we ask that you touch everyone attached to this channel. Open doors, enlarge their coasts, enlarge their territory, close doors that no man can open, open doors that no man can shut. Your word says the heart of the king is in your hands. God, we're asking you to soften the heart of the king. God, your word said that you would open up the window of heaven and pour us out a blessing we can't even receive. God, open up the window for us and begin to pour. Your word says these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. God, we ask that you lay hands on the sick right now. Touch them from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet. We bind every spirit of infirmity because your word says whatsoever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. So God, right now we bind the spirit of infirmity. We bind the spirit of sickness. And God, we ask that you lose healing amongst your people. Everyone attached to this channel, God, we ask that you bless them in a special way, oh God. Touch their finances. Touch their bank accounts, oh God. Raises and bonuses. Checks in the mail, God. Do it for them now. In the mighty name of Yeshua. You said if we had faith the size of a mustard seed, we can say into the mountains, be thou removed. God, move mountains right now. Remove stumbling blocks right now. Be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Guide our way right now, God. Show us the doors we need to walk through and the ones we need to turn away from. Show us the path that we need to take in order for your divine purpose to be brought forth in our lives. Touch us now, God, in a way that only you can. And we'll forever honor you and praise you and lift you up. In the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray. Amen. So be it. You know, sometimes the best way to pray for yourself is to pray for others. Because what God can do for others, baby, he can do for you too. But another reason that I really wanted to pray is because of the topic we're discussing today. Because today we're diving into some medieval tea. <laughs> Literally. We're talking about the bubonic play or as it's more dramatically known as the black death so grab your drink and let's get into it so now what we're going to do first is we're going to get into some history of this thing and then we'll move on up to today's story because i really want y'all to understand what's going on when i say someone is playing in the plague jar and they must be stopped so, the bubonic plague is a type of infection caused by the Yersinia pestis bacterium, which is spread mostly by fleas on rodents or other animals. Humans who are bitten by the fleas can then come down with the plague. It's an example of a disease that can spread between animals and people, what they refer to as a zoonotic disease. 
So if you have animals that are prone to fleas, dogs, cats, rats, ferrets, squirrels, whatever you have, it's time to get some flea collars, some flea sprays, some flea peels, all of it. Because peep this right, it's the middle of the 14th century and Europe is bustling with trade, right? People are living their best medieval lives and then all of a sudden disaster strikes. Ships arrive from the east and they've brought some very unwanted passengers, rats. But it wasn't just the rats, no. These rats were hosting some uninvited guests, fleas carrying the Yersinia pestis bacteria. Now these little flea bites might seem harmless, but they pack a very deadly punch. Once the bacteria entered the human bloodstream, it spread rapidly. People would develop these painful swollen lip nodes known as buboes, hence where they got the name, the bubonic plague. These symptoms were brutal. Fevers, chills, vomiting, and those nasty buboes, right? And within days, many were deceased. It spread like a wildfire, wiping out entire towns. It's estimated that the Black Death killed around 25 million people in Europe alone, about a third of the population for that time. Can you imagine the horror? So what made this thing so deadly? The bacteria was super contagious. It spread through flea bites, direct contact with infected tissues, and even through the air in some cases. Plus, the living conditions back then were pretty grim. They were crowded, unsanitary, and the perfect conditions for disease to spread. People became terrified because they didn't understand what was happening. Some of them thought it was a punishment from God. Others blamed it on bad air. Some even blamed it on witchcraft. And without proper medical knowledge or treatments, they were pretty much helpless. It drastically reduced the population, which led to labor shortages. But it also sparked advances in public health and hygiene practices. So let me help you to understand how bad this thing was. This thing was known to be indiscriminately contagious, meaning merely touching someone's clothes would appear to itself communicate the sickness to the toucher. People who were perfectly healthy when they went to bed at night could be deceased by morning. These people would be completely covered in black boils that oozed blood and pus. It was referred to as the Great Pestilence. In the early 1340s, this thing had struck China, India, Persia, Syria, and Egypt, all through trading ships. And it didn't discriminate. It affected men and women alike. These swellings would be found in the groin, under the armpits. It got to the size of a common apple. In some people, it was the size of an egg. I need you to understand what this thing is. Trigger warning, the next few clips will contain images and videos in relation to the play. Viewer discretion is advised. At the end of the Mongol trade routes lies the port city of Kaffa on the Black Sea, starting point for merchant ships en route to Italy. In 1347, the Mongols attacked the Christian city of Kaffa, hoping to take this vital trade link for themselves. But in the heat of hostilities, the Mongols suddenly confront a virulent new enemy, plague. It inspires them to launch a final desperate plan. The Mongols got the plague and had to call off the siege. But before they left, they decided to catapult their dead corpses, the dead bodies of their victims into the town in order to, quote, extinguish everyone inside and give the plague to their enemies. And apparently this is how the plague was communicated by the Mongols to Europeans. While the story might be more legend than fact, the Mongol pestilence spreads to the townspeople of Kaffa. Many historians believe it hitches a ride on merchant boats bound for Europe. And its first port of call is the island of Sicily. And in the towns, ships from the Black Sea sail into harbor, bearing something foul. 
below decks, the Italians find a cargo of corpses. The few survivors are reported to have sickness clinging to their very bones. When the townspeople realize the danger, they try to banish the plague ships from their harbor, but it is too late. The plague has already taken hold, and the dying begins. <coughs> Initially, it would have been difficult to tell uh, the, the, the early symptoms of Black Death from a very heavy flu-like, what we would consider to be flu-like symptoms. And fevers, chills, and the high temperature. And then there would be a second stage where there would be development of the welts, the swelling of the bubo. It's a spread. It can be very, very rapid. It can cause septic shock. Uh, your blood pressure will drop very rapidly. Uh, see multi-organ failure. The vascular system can become leaky and you can have hemorrhaging. The buboes themselves are very, very painful. It's a very awful way to die. As the plague rages through the Sicilian town of Messina, the survivors have only one place to turn, the Holy Mother of God. <laughs> Those still able to walk trek to her shrine six miles away and carry her back to the city. Though the Sicilians shun their Messinese neighbors, they cannot outrun the disease. The mark of sickness leaps across the island with startling speed. And the horror has just begun. Already other Genoese ships from Kaffa are landing on the Italian mainland. They bear furs, textiles, and rats, all fine purveyors of death. Like an avenging angel, the plague will sweep across an unsuspecting continent as the apocalypse begins. The plague is first documented on the Black Sea in 1347. And it's Mongols who seem to bring the plague. The Silk Road became a superhighway for disease. Coming out of Central Asia across the plains were different intersecting parts of the Silk Road. Traveling with the caravans were rats. Traveling with the rats were fleas. Traveling with the fleas in the, sort of the intestines of the fleas were parasites. And that's how plague made its first entrance with trade goods from the east into the Mediterranean world. In the Middle Ages, plague spread maybe about two kilometers per day by land routes, and it also spread by shipping routes to major ports. The plague was devastating as it made a relentless march from Italy across to France, Spain, Portugal, up to England, and then as it continued to make its way north up to Germany and to the Netherlands. These cities had all the conditions to sustain plague, the filth, the squalor, and then you had this massive number of people all packed together in these small dwellings, and it was the exact sort of situation you would want if you were trying to cause a plague epidemic. This plague was an absolute horror for our species. Roughly two-thirds of the population of Europe was, was simply eliminated. The world would seem as though it were coming to an end. People start turning to the church to ask for the hand of God, and it strikes priests and bishops and clerics just as much as it strikes others. Civil law broke down. There was no way to administer a city in these conditions. It was mass hysteria and mass fear. At the end of the day, although the plague is an absolutely horrible condition, it sets the stage for new thinking. 
they had a, a deep effect on human civilization because the structure of society changed. The feudal society is broken down. People who once were peasants can now possibly become merchants. History is so fundamentally changed by the plague. I would make the argument that disease is probably one of the few greatest forces of human history. Now why would I take the time out to bring this disgusting and disturbing thing to my bubbly channel? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Here's why. Someone in Colorado has the plague. Yep, that's the same plague that killed millions of Europeans during the Middle Ages. It's not clear how the person is doing or how they got infected, but the bacteria is transmitted by fleas and rats. It is now treated with antibiotics, but it can still cause serious complications if it's not caught early. Time now for your top stories on CBS News Colorado. The Pueblo County Department of Health, along with state health officials, are investigating a human case of plague based on preliminary test results. Plague caused by the Yersinia pestis bacteria. It's spread through fleas carried by infected rodents. People can get it from a flea bite. To protect yourself and your pets, avoid contact with dead animals. Don't let pets roam near prairie dog colonies. Back in 2021, a child in La Plata County died from the plague. Well, hey everybody, this is Robert and welcome to this Outbreak Newscast. Now in Colorado, the Pueblo Department of Public Health and Environment, in collaboration with the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, report investigating a human case of plague based on preliminary test results. If confirmed, this will be the third human plague case in the U.S. this year to date. In February, Oregon health officials confirmed a case in Deschutes County. That individual was likely infected by their symptomatic pet cat. That was the first case in Oregon since 2015. And also this year in March, New Mexico officials reported a fatal human plague case in Lincoln County. That was the first case of human plague in New Mexico since 2021 and the first fatality since 2020. Now the CDC says an average of seven human plague cases are reported each year in the United States. Most human cases in the U.S. are acquired in two regions. One, the northern New Mexico, northern Arizona, and southern Colorado area. And two, California, southern Oregon, and far western Nevada. Over 80% of the United States plague cases have been the bubonic form. Now, plague is an infectious disease caused by the bacterium Yersinia pestis. It is found in animals throughout the world, most commonly rats, but other rodents like ground squirrels, prairie dogs, chipmunks, and rabbits. Fleas typically serve as the vector for plague bacteria. Symptoms of plague usually begin in humans two to eight days after exposure to an infected animal or flea. These symptoms may include a sudden onset of fever, nausea, weakness, chills, muscle aches, and or visible swollen lymph nodes called boboes. People can also get infected through direct contact with an infected animal or through inhalation and in the case of pneumonic plague, person to person. Yersinia pestis is treatable with antibiotics if started early enough. There are three forms of human plague, bubonic, septicemic, and pneumonic. Pueblo County officials advise all individuals to protect themselves and their pets from plague. Some steps you can take include eliminate spaces, eliminate places that rodents can hide and breed around your home, garage, shed, or recreation area. Remove brush, rock piles, trash, and piles of lumber. Avoid contact with dead animals. If you must handle a sick or dead animal, follow these guidelines. First, put on an insect repellent to protect yourself from fleas. Then use a long handled shovel to place it in the garbage bag. Lastly, place the bag in an outdoor garbage bag. Use insect repellent that contains 20 to 30% DEET to prevent flea bites. Treat pants, socks, shoe tops, arms, and legs. Do not let pets sleep in bed with you. Treat dogs and cats for fleas on a regular basis. Flea collars have not been proven effective. Do not allow pets to hunt or roam in rodent areas, such as prairie dog colonies. And finally, keep pet food in rodent-proof containers. Thanks for listening. 
So this thing that has caused mass hysteria and mass death has been confirmed on U.S. soil. And get this, this isn't the first time, but they aren't sending out mass warnings about this. You see, majority of the clips that I showed were only about 30 seconds in length. Where's the detailed coverage about this thing being on U.S. soil? and has been on U.S. soil, but they're not really notifying the public so the public can protect themselves. But that's okay, because that's what I'm here for. Now peep this. If you think that's something, what's even more interesting, and this is why I say someone is playing in the plague jar, is that a lot of the world's most deadliest viruses are housed in these so-called biosafe laboratories, and several are in the U.S. Now, where would probably shock you, but peep this. Thursday, October 4th, 2007, the House of Representatives, Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations, Committee on Energy and Commerce, met in DC. They had a meeting and here what here's what the meeting was about. Germs, viruses, and secrets. The silent proliferation of bio laboratories in the United States. Now what they said was each member would be recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. So this guy starts off and he says, our hearing today will focus on the risk associated with the recent increase of domestic BSL-3 and BSL-4 labs. These BSL-3 and 4 labs are the facilities where research is conducted on highly infectious viruses and bacteria that can cause injury or death. Some of the world's most exotic and most dangerous diseases are handled at BSL-3 and 4 labs, including anthrax, foot and mouth disease, and Ebola fever. The accidental or deliberate release of some of these biological agents handled at these labs could have catastrophic consequences. Yet, as we will hear from the Government Accountability Office, the GAO, I didn't even know that existed, no single government agency has the ultimate responsibility for ensuring the safety and securing of these high contaminant labs. However, GAO states there is a major expansion of the number of BSL laboratories occurring both in the United States and abroad, but the full extent of that expansion is unknown. So they don't even know how many there are in the United States. But let me tell you where a few of them are located at. Galveston National Laboratory on the campus of the University of Texas Medical Branch. At Boston University's National Emerging Infectious Diseases Laboratories. And the Center for Biotechnology and Drug Design at Georgia State University. You got it. A lot of the most deadly diseases in the world are housed in universities. Say what? Now why is this important? Well this is important because a lot of the viruses that we have now that are running amok, a lot of them were the result of accidents in the research laboratory. You don't believe me? Okay, watch this. In 1903 in the United States, the Burkholderia Male this outbreak happened when a laboratory worker became infected with the bacteria and developed glanders while performing an autopsy on an inoculated guinea pig. She had an open wound on her finger while she was working. She was said to survive. 1932 in the United States, the B virus. William Brebner died from a viral infection after being bit by a monkey during research. The viral agent was later discovered to be the B virus, which was named in memory of Brebner. 1960 to 1993 in Europe, foot and mouth disease. Foot and mouth disease virus accidentally released at least 13 times from European laboratories, including those producing FMDV vaccines between 1960 and 1993, causing nearby foot and mouth disease outbreak. 1966, smallpox, United Kingdom. The 1966 smallpox outbreak in the United Kingdom was an outbreak 
outbreak of mild smallpox, which began with Tony McLennan, a photographer at the Medical School of Birmingham, which housed a smallpox laboratory and where 12 years later a fatal smallpox outbreak would occur, also beginning with a medical photographer. Soviet Union, 1971, smallpox. The 1971 aural smallpox incident was the outbreak of a viral disease which occurred as the result of a field test at the Soviet Biological Weapons Facility on an island in the Aral Sea. The incident sickened 10 people of whom three died and came to widespread public notice only in 2002. Ebola, 1976, United Kingdom. Ebola laboratory infection by the accidental stick of contaminated needles in the United Kingdom. 1977 through 1979, H1N1 influenza virus. H1N1 influenza virus reappeared circulating in humans in 1977 in the Soviet Union and in China. Some virologists have suggested the cause of the reappearance was a laboratory escape of a 1949-1950 virus based on serologic and genetic testing. The WHO conducted an investigation in 1978 after which they concluded the virus was not likely laboratory originated. They suggest that the outbreak was the result of human challenge trials of the vaccine against the 1950 H1N1 virus. So basically they're saying in an effort to try to create a vaccine for the H1N1, they created something even worse. And you don't think somebody's around here playing in the plague jar? 2002, anthrax due to a Fort Detrick's anthrax contaminant breach. West Nile virus, two cases of laboratory acquired West Nile virus infections through dermal punctures. I know you can't possibly think this stuff is just appearing out of nowhere. SARS, Taiwan, a 44-year-old senior scientist at the National Defense University, another college, in Taipei was confirmed to have the SARS virus. He had been working on the SARS study in Taiwan's only BSL-4 lab. The Taiwan CDC later stated the infection occurred due to laboratory misconduct. And somehow someone doesn't think housing some of the world's deadliest diseases in a college lab is safe. If someone could hack into Microsoft defense systems, do you not think someone can hack into these laboratories that are that are housing these diseases and cause a mass outbreak what are we doing we're constantly around here trying to play god i don't know about you but for me there's only one god but we're trying to tamper in his territory without his power and we're creating messes that we can't control just because you can clone an animal doesn't mean that you should look i saw pet cemetery i'm not trying to have a clone pet dog you remember that scene in Jurassic Park where he said, You see the danger uh, shown inherent uh, in what you're doing here? Genetic power is the most awesome force the planet's ever seen, but you wield it like a, a kid that's found his dad's gun. It's hardly appropriate to start hurling generalizations. Uh, if I may, um, I'll tell you the problem with the scientific power that you're, that you're using here. Uh, it didn't require any discipline to attain it. You know, you read what others had done and you, and you took the next step. You didn't earn the knowledge for yourselves, so you don't take any responsibility for it. You stood on the shoulders of geniuses uh, to accomplish something as fast as you could, and before you even knew what you had, you, you patented it and packaged it and slapped it on a plastic lunchbox, and now you're selling it. You want to sell it. Well, I, I don't think you're giving us our due credit. Our scientists have done things which nobody's ever done before. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think they should. And this is the problem that I have with today's society. We're getting smarter. We have brain power. We're advancing in technology, in medical research. But we're spending so much time focusing on what we can do that we're not spending enough time focusing on whether we should do it. From the music to science 
to the medical field. Who is stopping to weigh the options between what we should do and what we could do? And then thinking down the line to the effects that it will have if we do do it. At the end of the day, a building is a building. If that building breaks down, this BSL-4 and BSL-3 laboratory that's holding all of these highly deadly viruses and bacteria, what fail safe do you have for your fail safe in case the building breaks down and this thing gets out? Isn't that what happened with the Ebola outbreak in the United States? Who's monitoring the labs that's monitoring the viruses? dealing with the viruses, handling the viruses. Because if you get contaminated and you go back home, you're spreading that to whoever you came in contact with, whoever is in your home, mama, daddy, sister, brother, child. That child is going to school. You're going to work. And this is how pandemics spread. And as you heard with the Black Death, you can get this from touching the clothes of an infected individual. So just because we can doesn't always mean we should. Listen, I don't know what's going on in the world today. I have no explanation for it. All I know is somebody's playing in the plague jar and they need to stop. In my humble opinion, this is just a mass mass attempt at mass population control because the world is way too overcrowded. And I think now in an effort to depopulate some of these areas, they're playing in the plague jar and releasing plagues. It's like a giant game of of the squid games being played with viruses and bacteria and only the strong survive. Only those smart enough to protect themselves survive. I told y'all that this is just July. The election is in November. That's a whole hell of a lot of time for a lot of foolishness to take place because now it looks like you got to protect yourself against your own pets. So listen, it's time for us to look on Amazon and find out how to protect our long and protect our homes against fleas and ticks and bugs and mosquitoes and chow. This is too much. Drop in the comments and let me know what you think about this. All of this. If I have any confidants in Colorado, (laughs) y'all be safe. Figure out how to protect yourself because they're clearly trying to get us up out of here. That's all I have for this one. Stay tuned because the next video will be talking about the Listeria outbreak that's going on right now. Hit that like and subscribe button and the notification bell so you'll be notified when we jump into whichever sector we jump into for another show. Consider supporting the channel. The Cash App is on the screen. And again, before we conclude, I am praying for everyone, all of my confidants, my Fizz fam, my Champagne gang, who are dealing with any illnesses, any sicknesses, health issues, mental health issues, praying for us all, as I hope you're doing for me. Until next time, always remember, if it doesn't cause you to elevate, it's causing you to depreciate. Now raise those glasses, clink, and let's drink till we meet again. Ta-ta.